Okay, we will just wait a few minutes while people are entering. Okay, we will get started and hopefully um, we will have some people entering uh, as we proceed. And um, as you know, this will be recorded. Um, so thank you everyone. I am Lynn Domina, professor of English here at Northern Michigan University. Um, and this is Let's Talk Books at NMU. Northern Michigan University is located on the sacred homelands of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy. Today, I'm welcoming Susan Branson, author of Scientific Americans, Invention, Technology, and National Identity. This series will continue throughout this academic year on the third Friday of each month at one o'clock Eastern time. My guest in November will be Ed M. Madden, author of Engaging Italy, American Women's Utopian Visions and Transnational Networks. You will notice at the bottom of your screen, the icons for the chat and the Q&A. If you want to ask questions, simply put them in the Q&A and I will um, ask, ask them for you at the end of the presentation. This episode will be recorded and posted on YouTube. To access it or to access earlier episodes, simply search for Let's Talk Books at NMU or email me at ldomina at nmu.edu and I'll forward that to you. Before we get started, I wanna give a big thanks to Matt Herbig from Audiovisual Services here at NMU, who is helping with the technical end of this series and to Dr. Rob Wynn, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who is supporting us financially. Now I'd like to introduce Susan Branson. She is professor and chair of the history department at Syracuse University. Her first book, These Fiery Frenchified Dames, examines women's changing public roles as they resulted from the social, cultural, and political forces at work in American society in the last two decades of the 18th century. Her second book, Dangerous to Know, Women, Class, and Crime in the Early Republic, investigates the intersection of crime, class, and gender in the early 19th century. And now we have scientific Americans. So Susan, welcome. And I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, all right, I can't talk and do things at the same time. So I'm gonna do the screen share now. So if I can get my slides up and running. So hang on. All right. seem to be there. Are you are you seeing my PowerPoint? Lynn? No. 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 How about now? Nope. Um see now why did this work? Wait. There we go. There we go. Now it's now we're seeing it. Okay. Just have to make sure I press all the right buttons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I I'm I'm gonna talk you through my book, um, both in terms of the topics and the themes. Uh, but I have lots of slides to show you. And the reason I have lots of, uh, lots of slides to show you is number one, because publishers are stingy and they don't let you put a lot of images in your book, even though you want to. So you're going to get to see a lot of things that I would have put in if I haven't had, if I'd had the opportunity, but also because um, kind of the whole point of, of what I wanted to show in my book was just how immersed Americans are 
in science and in, in, in particularly in technology, but that immersion has a lot to do with popular culture and consumer goods. And so basically objects and the ways that people participate and where they go and what they see. Um, so as, as the book goes along, I spent a lot of time talking about tangible objects and ways that people can interact with science and technology that perhaps might not be seen as particularly professional or you know really leading to to some outcome that's going to lead to technological developments um, but nonetheless has a, a significant role to play not just in perhaps the ways in which people are educated so that they can develop technologies but also the the ideas that they have about how science and technology play into national identity right so much of this just has to do with how many people can be involved in it and and the ways that they're involved in it and how that expands beyond just what people buy, what they invent, how they use it, um, but actually shaping it or shaping ideas about it in term in terms of what the nation is. So, so there's all these things kind of fold together and and overlap. So, let me first show you. These are the 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 chapters, and I, it's somewhat organized chronologically. I mean, I definitely go from earlier things to later things, and and end in the the 1870s. But it's also done topically, again, because I really wanted to spend a lot of time looking at the ways in which, especially certain technologies, resonate you know, in, in an amazing way and in a variety of ways in American culture. So I start talking about the background to technological development and education, and then, as you can see, um, and I'll go through this as we go along, but air balloons and machinery, and all right, chapter four, you're looking at that and it means nothing to you, but I will tell you it's about water systems, which you might think is like watching paint dry, but I can convince you that it's not. So stay tuned for that in a minute. Um, and then phrenology, and then finally looking at, looking at the ways in which these very large physical venues develop to promote technologies and for people to experience them. So that's how the, the book is structured. So let me first start talking about what's happening before independence and how people are suddenly not scientific Americans in 1776. They had always been scientific Americans and been inclined towards curiosity, at least about science you know, long before that. Um, and the first image that I did put in the book is this calendar token, which was uncovered by archeologists when they were um, excavating for the, the convention center in, in Philadelphia and presumably fell down somebody's well or they dropped it on the street, but it's about the size of a quarter. And what you can see is that it's, it's a perpetual calendar um, and it's telling you, you know, days of the week and, and Sundays of the month and what have you. But since this is for um, the, the, the late 18th century, what this calendar, calendar token is showing you, if you see this, is this year expect the comet without danger. So in other words, they're expecting Halley's Comet to come along. And it's something that's actually imprinted on this coin that somebody's going to carry around with them for an entire year. It's a reminder not just about Sundays or, or what have you, um, but at this moment when people are excited about the fact that there's a comet that's going to pass through the solar system that'll be visible from Earth, thinking about the ways in which earlier ideas about nature as this dangerous, untamable thing that might hurt you, i.e. comets hitting the earth and you know evaporating everyone, um, suddenly there's this sort of this new confidence and this reassurance that no, really it's something different and it's something not only that isn't going to hurt us, but that we can investigate and, and learn more about. So what I love about this, this object is that it, it just kind of captures that moment of transition and the ways that people start thinking differently about science, um, but also just how many people are doing it, right? This is something that that presumably many people carried in their pocket, although only one person lost it that we know of. So um, it's, it's, it's just a very, very good image to start with. And the other thing that I talk about in the early chapter of the background to, you know, 
what happens after independence is thinking about the ways that people already interact with science and technologies. And, and one of the primary ways that they do this is through almanacs. And after the Bible, almanacs are the thing that most people have in their homes because it's useful. It's got tides, it's got road distances, it's got translations between different kinds of money that are floating around in colonial America, just all sorts of stuff. But it's also, as many of you know, if you're familiar, certainly even with the almanacs that are published today, it's kind of miscellaneous. And in the 18th century, it's like, well, whatever space you've got left in your almanac where you get all of those charts and the things that you know have to be in there every year, you might insert some current events or something of interest. And in, in many instances, it has to do with science and especially with astronomy, um, especially in a year like where you're expecting Halley's Comet. So that's why, for instance, in this 1772 almanac right there on the front, it's got an individual using his um, telescope to look, look at the stars. And uh, again, when I'm thinking about the ways in which this is not just something that's an elite practice, although much of it is, and it would become less so over time, if you think about how there's just everyday objects that people have that would allow them to participate in these kinds of observations, here we have, and I apologize, you know, these, these are elite men. So there's the Duke of Wellington down there on the, the bottom left and George Washington on the bottom right. Um, but many, many people have spy glasses, right? They're not, they're not technically telescopes, but they're the kinds of things that are used for looking at distances either across land or sea um, or put it, pointing it up in the air. So there, there are ways in which people for centuries are engaging in science in, in these ways with the things that they have at hand. And of course, um, as eclipses and, and various other kinds of astronomical phenomena occur, you see in the newspapers or in the almanacs and Franklin, not surprisingly, was, was very good at, at promoting this sort of thing. It's like, here's how to do this safely. Well, just get a piece of smoked glass and you'll be able to look at the eclipse, you know, because everybody's gonna want to because it's this interesting phenomena. So there's all, all of these ways in which people are participating in science in the 18th century, you know, le leading up to independence. And of course, there's, there are ways in which you can do this um, more uh, intensely or, or buying more equipment, depending on how much money you have. So this, this is just an illustration showing a scientist giving a public demonstration to these elite men and women. Um, and then over here on the right, this is a microscope that's highly embellished and of course, what I always tell my students is, it's like, if you buy a microscope, you're buying it because you want to see something up close that's just minuscule. And it's the power of the lens and how well the, the, the microscope is put together that's going to allow you to do that. So if you see an object like this, with all of this embellishment, it's kind of crossing the streams because presumably this is also going to be a very well-made microscope, but it's also an object that shows off your wealth and conspicuous consumption. It's beautiful, right? It's, it's almost like a piece of jewelry. And so again, as I'm arguing, the ways in which people are exposed to science for, from a variety of venues, but also for a variety of reasons, Here's a way in which we see this crossover between people who would like to demonstrate their wealth, their knowledge, their sophistication, and, and at the same time, they're learning something about science or, or particularly about the nat natural world. And here's one that's a little more rudimentary. This is a, a solar microscope. So you can see here's the, both the photograph of what it actually is. And then in this illustration, you can see how it's mounted in a window so that the light source is coming from, from the, the sun and then projecting it onto the screen. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's a man, a woman and a child and they're all staring at these frightening bugs and scary faces and what have you. And a lot of times these would come with ready-made slides that you could put in there and see whatever the slide maker decided to put on that. Um, and it becomes an object of sociability where you would go to someone's home if they had purchased one of these solar microscopes and you would sit around and you know look at all the slides under the microscope. So again, it's ways in which 
perpetuating or furthering the ambitions of people who would like more scientifically educated Americans to take place can happen in a variety of, a variety of these venues that aren't necessarily um, specifically designed to be educational or, or directing people towards that. It's like, it's a form of entertainment, but it's entertainment that tells you something about science. And the other thing that plays into this in terms of thinking about how we're expanding um, knowledge and expanding the, the people who have opportunities to acquire this knowledge and, and use it and apply it is, is gender. So this is an illustration from a French 18th century scientific text. And it's all about optics and you know what you, what you can see and how you can see it and how, how lenses are shaped and what have you. But what I love about this is that on the right-hand side, presumably you've got this, this instructor or this, this scientist and he's looking through his microscope. And then on the left, you have this young woman um, who, you know, she's kind of in the, a, a moment, like a eureka moment, right? She's holding up her hand. She's seeing something through this mi microscope. And so in the sense that, you know, people, people understanding that they too can be part of this endeavor, it's like, well, I'm not male. Oh, but wait, there's women there. And and later, as we see almanacs by Benjamin Banneker in the United States, people could say, well, I'm not white, but no, wait, there are people of color who are participating in science. So there's ways ways in which this is opening up opportunities to, to lots of people, and sometimes in, in very direct ways or in subtle ways like this, where you just you're just seeing here's a woman doing science, even though she's a woman on a page and she's completely fictitious. The fact that she's there sends a very powerful message about who can do science, right? And so all of this, as I say, is happening before we even get to uh, the kinds of initiatives that are going to be pursued as early as the 1780s after independence. And this, this is one of my personal favorites. I, this is like, don't try this at home. But if you've read these texts, and if you've been to some of these lectures, and you want to purchase some of this equipment, perhaps you'd like to hang your child from the ceiling, you know, and have him connected to the, the, the static electricity machine that this woman is, is operating. Um, and then what we're seeing here is very tiny. So I'll just explain. So the, the little girl who's standing on the, the, the barrel, she's holding her hands over some um, shredded pieces of paper. And as the electric current passes through the boy into her, and as she holds out her hand, the pieces of paper are going to fly up in, in the air. It's like, so again, it's, it's science. And presumably if you were observing this or constructing it yourself, you would be explaining the science behind it, but it's clearly also spectacle. Um, and if I'm sure many of you have been to science museums and, you know, gone and seen the big giant electric static electricity ball. And then of course, with someone like me, if you've got really long hair, it just goes in all directions, right? And it's fun. But there's there's science behind it, and there's a purpose behind it, and so we 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 see this as well. And and clearly, for for much of this with the equipment and the texts, it's still limited um, to elites. But it's going to start to to spread out on the landscape. And just to give you an idea of whether people were were really buying these things, so this is the uh, probate inventory um, from uh, um, Hannah Washington, who, as far as I know. It's no relation to George Washington, but this is from, from the early 19th century. And you can see that in this inventory, one of the things that's there is Dr. Priestley's machine with apparatus, which means, and that, that's the image that I have on the right, it's, it's one of these static electricity um, machines. And it, also what's interesting there, and it says damaged, right? So maybe that means that somebody dropped it and it broke, or maybe it means they used it a lot at these these social events that that people were hanging other hanging their children from ceilings so uh one one of my endeavors wasn't wasn't just to, to look at the ways in which you know perhaps texts or prescriptive literature suggests that people should do this but I, I actually went looking to see if people actually purchased these things or participated in in these events or in these lectures and there's lots and lots of itinerant lecturers in the 18th century, and some of them are just lecturing about science. And this is this is from um, Isaac Kinnerly's broadside, talking about the, the the things that he's going to show in one of these public lectures that he gave, and it's very detailed. It's like he's going to tell you everything that he's going to do, and you can see that a lot of it 
is is very spectacular. Um, but of course, as Kinnersley would give his lectures, you know, we'd have the electricity ball and the, the girl with the, the paper or all sorts of other things, but he would explain the science behind it. Um, so lots of people had the opportunity to go and listen to these itinerant lecturers talk, talk about science. And then of course, eventually we do begin to see the practical applications for this. And this is um, an image demonstrating the, 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 the ways in which having a lightning rod on your house or your church um, is going to protect you from, from fire and from lightning strikes. So along with the spectacle and sort of the more abstract, well, let's investigate principles of science, you begin to see the ways in which people are applying this to their daily lives in, in, in ways that are going to be profitable. So all of that is there before we get to the revolution. Um, so the overlay on that, of course, is after independence and just all of the issues that have to do with like getting getting Britain off off the landscape because the British are still occupying forts and they're interfering with trade. Um, one of the things that's on the agenda for uh, Americans is getting the economy up and running and encouraging emigration and probably many of you are already familiar with, with Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, which includes many topics, but among them um, are the ways in which he's, he inventoried just what kinds of natural phenomena exist in America and especially what kinds of animals exist. And he made it his mission to try and counter some of the negative propaganda that was coming from scientists like Buffon in, in France, who claimed that America was swampy and diseased. And if, if Europeans went there, they were going to shrivel and die. And all the animals are smaller and everything's bigger in Europe. And so Jefferson in, in the notes in the state of Virginia and elsewhere, he's like literally counting and weighing and measuring and showing the ways in which this is not true. So he, he made it his mission to try and, and counter this. And this, I'll just, some, some blatant advertising. This is a really great book by Dugatkin that explains all of this and the moose that Jefferson sent to Buffon, you know, is proof, proof of, of trying to accomplish this. Um, but very early on um, in the new nation, people are, are consciously aware of how propaganda is going to influence political economy and immigration and all sorts of other things that are going to be important to developing the nation. And one, one of the ways that we see this, again, going back to visuals, in 1801, when um, some mastodon bones are discovered in Newburgh, New York, and Charles Wilson Peel is sent by the American Philosophical Society to continue to excavate more bones other than what had already been dug up. He builds this huge excavation machine and here's this painting of that. And what I love about this is, so of course he's gonna put it on display in his museum so people can see it, but there's all of, all of this all newspaper reportage of the discovery of the bones, how big they are, and of course, Thomas Jefferson is extremely happy about this, right? Confirming that no, things are big in America too. Um, but Peel's painting, and Judith McGraw has a, a wonderful essay on this. If you if you look at what's in the foreground of this painting, it's not the mastodon bones. In fact, you can't actually even see any bones. You just see the the drawing over here on the right hand side um, of of Peel holding up a thigh bone or or whatever. But it's the machine that he constructs to basically get all the water out of the hole so that they can continue to look for bones. And so what he's highlighting is his, his particularly, but American ingenuity in the kind of mechanical devices that Americans can, can come up with. And then of course, later, he also um, has this painting of the artist in the museum where you can see behind the curtain, there's the reconstructed mastodon. Um, and over on the left, there's a female patron of the museum who seems to be you know, expressing her surprise or fear or excitement or or something about the mastodon, and and you know this this painting is just a tease, right? Because he's like, well, I'm going to let you see part of it. It's behind the curtain. You got to come to the museum and pay me some money to see the rest of it. Um, but the fact that this is what he's highlighting as um, the contents of his museum, it's not just 
the stuffed animals or other kinds of bones, but it's like, you really got to come and see this really huge mastodon. Um, and at the same time, obviously, Peel's doing a lot of personal promotion. So there's ways in which uh, ideas about the natural world and promotion about the American nat natural world fit very well with this idea of, you know, sort of building, building up American resources and propaganda about the virtues of American resources that are, that are coming from, from places like this. Uh, and then in my second chapter about balloons, I spent a lot of time talking about balloons because, not because it's a successful technology. I mean, if you think about it, it's like balloons never really took off, so to speak, um, as a form, form of practical transportation, although there certainly are attempts at it. Um, but uh, balloons become this, this sort of this, this aspirational symbol of what's possible. And obviously not just in the United States because the first place that balloons are launched obviously is in France. Um, but Americans take this up with enthusiasm. And as I say, it's not because they're really gonna use balloons to, to travel the country, but balloons are going to, balloons are going to be um, sort of a, a, a spokes object for the things that are possible in the United States. So this is just an, an image of the first, first flight by the Montgolfier brothers um, in Paris in the 80s. Um, and I'll show you this and keep this in mind when I talk about what happens in New Jersey in a minute. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the balloons that came down in the suburbs of, of France as the, the people in the surrounding area had no idea what it was. And it came down and they kind of went after it with their torches and pitchforks. And this image sort of captures this idea of, the, you know, is it a monster, this thing that just fell from the sky, um, you know, complete unfamiliarity with this. And, and apparently um, at one point the, the king um, told his, his ministers to issue, issue pamphlets around the country saying, if you see this thing in the sky, it's a balloon, don't kill it. Please report where it came down so the balloonist can come and fetch it. Um, and again, so it's this interesting transitional moment, kind of like the, the, the calendar token where you know, there's, there's sort of these, these fears of the unknown and sort of what, what might be seen as, as, as monsters, but really are symbols of um, you know, developing technologies and these, these new sciences that, that people are mastering. So not suffice it to say that even before balloons are launched in the United States, Americans are extremely excited about them and continue to be after balloon launches um, happen, happen here. Uh, and again, getting back to how technology permeates popular culture and how those things sort of, you know, reinforce one another. These are just some advertisements showing all of the types of balloon objects that are for sale in the United States. So here you see the balloon watch chains and jewelry, um, and there's other, other accessories um, as well as women's stays and, and what have you. And there's a balloon everything. And so I guess maybe partly covering the screen, but you'll see that almanac cover on the right. Many, many almanacs now have images of balloon launches and some of them this one is actually the balloon almanac it's like how can we capitalize on the popularity and the fascination that people have with this technology so there's there's just balloon everything as much as you can imagine and here's just some of the objects that that balloons are on um, on buttons and band boxes and teapots and um, that chair back it's it's kind of a dark image but that the entire chair back there in the center is is a carved balloon, and then the the clock in the center has has a balloon down in the the pendulum area. So people want to have something having to do with balloons in their house as objects, chairs at their dining table, or just decorating their their band boxes. So it's as I say, it's something that really doesn't have practical use, but becomes just just something that people are fascinated with and use it to convey other ideas or, or aspirations. And this, this is just a, a lovely comic cartoon, just making fun of the fact that women start having balloon sleeves or you know, balloon-like balloon, balloon -like, um, dresses in this period between the, the, the 1780s and, and the early 19th century. Um, and just you know, how absurd it is that, that presumably they're gonna float away because they've, they've got all of these 
presumably inflated dresses um, to deal with. Uh, so, you know, so, so, so there's definitely some depth, tongue and cheek, cheek there. Uh, but I'm wondering how many of you might have seen this. This is called a balloon plant, um, which definitely grows around here in, in Syracuse. And I think it's originally from China. And that fuzzy uh, advertisement there just says balloon vines because there's balloon beans and balloon cows and you name it. There's balloon everything. Um, this is what it looks like right before it opens. When the flower opens, it just looks like a flower. But right before it opens, it really does look like one of these, these tiny little air balloons. And then there's more balloon marketing, of course, um, for things that, again, have nothing to do with balloons like hair restorer or frying pans or just, just lots of ships that are named air balloon or balloon. I, it's like you start looking for balloons and you, you, you won't, you, you'll just see them everywhere, including the first balloon patent in the United States. And if you can see here where I've, I've circled it, it says federal balloon by Mr. McFarland, patent registered 1799. Apparently this is actually an exercise machine. It, again, it has nothing to do with balloons, but he's decided that if he calls it a federal balloon, maybe people will buy it because everybody wants to have a balloon <laughs> or see a balloon or ride in a balloon. And, and so fairly quickly after the first launches in, in France, balloons come to the United States and, and there's uh, first unmanned balloon launches and then manned balloon launches. Um, so people, at least on the East Coast, get to, to experience these very, very early on. And then about a decade later, one of the French aeronauts, uh, Blanchard, comes to the United States and does a balloon. He does several balloon launches, but the first one he does is from the prison yard in back of the state house in, in Philadelphia. And President Washington attends, Hamilton attends, probably Adams is, where, is there as well. And is, in essence, the entire federal government goes to watch this balloon launch. And Washington gives this speech. He gives Blanchard a passport. So it's sort of sealing this, this relationship between the aspirations of the American government and the um, and American identity with these balloons, even though you know, they're not really American, they're French, but they're now in America and they'll be claimed as such. And so this, this balloon launch, and, and for those of you who are from New Jersey, and if you are, you should be proud of that fact, um, because Blanchard's balloon went up in Philadelphia and it came down in what's now Deptford. And so Deptford Township has on their, you know, welcome to Deptford, they, they've got this, this image of, of the balloon to commemorate that. Um, so it didn't, it didn't last very long. Um, and when it came down uh, in a farmer's field, once again, the people in the area had no idea what it was. And Blanchard's account of this in his, his, his memoir, he talks about landing in this field and a farmer you know, approaching him with a pitchfork or a gun or with both. And Blanchard didn't speak English and the farmer didn't speak French. And so there was some suspicion on both, both sides. Um, and then apparently one of the things that Blanchard had taken up in his balloon to fortify himself was a bottle of wine. And so the extension of, of friendship and com camaraderie sort of over overcame the apprehension and, and Blanchard finally got his, his balloon back to Philadelphia. Um, and this is in all the, the newspapers, of course. And as I say, very reminiscent of um, the episode in, in the suburbs of, of France in, in the 1780s. So balloons are popular. Balloons make it onto commercial objects and everybody wants to go and see one of these balloon launches. So much so um, that in the first decades of the 19th century, one of these, these aeronauts that has a balloon launch in Philadelphia, there's this balloon riot. Um, and I put this image up here. This is not of that particular occasion, but what I wanted to, you to see is a couple of things that are, that are accurate about this. Number one is the crowd. And number two, if you can see that there's, um, a fence and then on top of the fence, there's actually something to, to block people's view. So these were paid experiences that were in pleasure gardens and that's where it was in the Vauxhall Gardens in, in Philadelphia. And um, this balloon launch was a fail and there's people inside who have paid, there's people outside who can't see it yet because it hasn't risen. 
who have not paid but want want to see what's going on. And when the fa when the balloon fails to go up, the people on the outside of the fence break down the fence and stampede stampede into the pleasure gardens, essentially because they're they're just mad that they didn't get to see the balloon um, and they destroy the balloon they destroy the instruments of the the orchestra that's playing apparently they drank all the alcohol that was there for the the paying customers um, and it's it's this huge kerfluffle um, and it seems rather odd but one of the things that that i wanted to point out as i mentioned this in my book is that's how in, intense the interest and fascination is with this technology. And of course, it, at this point, it's kind of a static technology in the sense that decade after decade, really all you're seeing is people going up in balloons that can't really be controlled. And you're seeing them go up and then you see them come down or sometimes they come down a little too too fast or too frequently or they don't go up at all. Um, but there's this, there's this continual interest in this, the potentials of this, this technology. Um, and this is, this is just decades later, this is a, a balloon launch on, on Boston Com Common. So here's some of the other ways in which it's immersed in, in popular culture. Um, you may not know this, but occasionally Santa Claus uses a balloon to get around instead of his reindeer. <laughs> um, and there are children's educational books. Um, this one happens to be mostly about geography, but um, the the children and the instructor that that go go up in the balloon and then hover over various parts of the earth, the balloon is the vehicle by which they do this. Um, and the subtext is, and they they wouldn't have been able to do this without this technology, which clearly doesn't exist yet, um, except in the minds of of um, these authors. But Rufus Porter tries to develop something that's really going to work. And this is kind of overlapping technologies because he does this in the 1840s. And you can see from this image where this is the prospectus for how he's going to develop this airship. Um, it's It's got a steam engine in it, right? It's not just a floating balloon. It's actually going to be controlled. It's going to be able to move forward and backwards because it's got this engine that's going to direct propellers and, and what have you. Um, and he's, he at least intends to build this. It never really does get built, but there's a lot of excitement about this as something that is feasible. And it's feasible for, for not only just sort of going back and forth from A to B, but at this moment in time, particularly potentially a way that you're gonna to get to the California gold fields. And so this is, this is a Courier and Ives sort of sarcastic take on this and all of these miners, the way they go to California and the miners here literally missing the boat that they're trying to get on so that they can sail around South America and get to California. But the other two technologies that they've put in this image on the left is Rufus Porter's airship. And then on the right, that's Mr. Golightly, and I'll, I'll show you another picture of, of him later on. Um, but all of these ways in which potential transportation can get people from the East Coast to the West Coast so they can participate um, in the California gold rush. So again, there's, there's you know, ways in which there's real transportation here and ways in which there's potential transportation. Um, and of course, Porter was thinking it really was going to work, but it didn't. So in terms of the time frame that I cover in my book, really the only practical use for balloons before the late 19th century is they use tethered balloons as observational posts during the Civil War. And here's some photographs showing the uh, one of the balloons being inflated and then the tethered balloon going up. And uh, the United States government formed an air balloon corps in the first years of the war. Um, to actually have these these observations, and they'd have a a telegraph um, line up there with them, so that they could go up and look at the the enemy defenses. And so here's um, from the New York Times a report on what one of these balloons is seeing about the Confederate de defenses near near Richmond. And there's a a balloon's eye view of the Capitol in Washington. And so it's about this time that just again in popular culture you start seeing lots of balloon balloons eye views, or sometimes they're called bird's eye views, of various areas around the, the country. And again, some of them are are um, 
completely made up. It's like they didn't really go up in a balloon. They've just, you know, taken measurements and, you know, come up with this idea of what something would look like from the air. But there are cases in which they really do take these sketches um, and get the dimensions and, and the logistics right from being up in a balloon and observing this. So what's interesting about this is that this report in the New York Times, um, it's like, right, so you put it in the newspaper and everybody knows you're doing it. They actually stopped the newspapers from putting these balloon reports in the public sphere because then the Confederates know that you're doing it. <laughs> so, you know, it's a it's a it's a form of military intelligence. And they quickly figured out that they didn't want everybody to know that this is what they were doing. Um, and the balloon air corps only lasts for a couple of years and then the government decides it's it's not really worth worth doing. Um, but it would seem that at least in many instances it, it was effective and in fact, you know, from the evidence of the ban on the newspapers reporting it it must have been extremely effective or they wouldn't have wanted the information to be um, kept secret. And this is another courier and Ives print and again. What's interesting is that clearly in the foreground, what we're seeing is, is this horrendous battle between the, the, the Union Army and, and Confederates. And that's what's front and foremost with, with the flags and, and you know, combat. But just up there on the left in the sky is one of those observation balloons. Um, and one of the things that, that I also try to argue about the ways in which it becomes very commonplace to think about technologies as part of everyday life is that the balloon is there again, just sort of incidentally, right? What Courier and Ives really want to show us is this this combat, this battle, this this moment um, of of conflict. But they want to be accurate about it, and so they'll put the balloon there because that's one of one of the things that was part of of the battle. Um, so I think this is true for many technologies and, and many, many other aspects of life is some, sometimes um, seeing what's incidental as opposed to what's, you know, front and for, foremost or foregrounded tells you much about what's in people's minds or what they take for granted or what they assume should be there because it doesn't need to be emphasized or foregrounded. Um, so... Um, Balloons don't get us very far, at least not in the first half of the 19th century. But another technology that clearly does, that again, already existed um, both, at least somewhat before um, the, the 1780s is, is steam technology. And again, once people realize that steam is going to be viable, that it's going to be useful, that it's going to be practical, you start seeing it show, showing up in these consumer goods. So here's a dinner plate that's got a, a railroad engine on it. Clearly doesn't look like, you know, recognizably railroad engines as they are today, um, but in its early form, you know, there's there's our, our steam powered railroad engine with, with the cars on it, on somebody's dinner plate. And again, looking at the ways in which uh, political economy and ideas about national identity are overlapping with these developing technologies, when John Finch, Fitch puts his early steamboat together, one of the first demonstrations that he has of this is to the Continental Congress, or sorry, the Constitutional Convention when it's in Philadelphia um, in 1787. So he's not just interested in showing off his technology to potential investors or potential consumers. He wants to get the government interested because this is something Clearly not that the government is going to throw money behind, but they might throw support in terms of legislation and all the things that that actually are going to follow, unfortunately not for John Fitch's benefit, um, but the ways in which steam transportation is going to be supported by government legislation. Um, and for one of the, one of those people, obviously, is Robert Fulton, who has the first successful steam-driven transportation. What's interesting about Fulton is that he is able to get a monopoly on steam transportation on the Hudson. Now that works for a while. Ultimately, um, there's a Supreme Court case in in <laughs> which John Marshall says, "No, you cannot have a monopoly on a waterway. You can have a monopoly on technology." You can have a monopoly on your steam engine design, but you cannot monopolize the Hudson River. Um, so 
these early technologies that the, the government is kind of finding their way in terms of, so what's, what's entrepreneurial enterprise and how much should the government be involved and in, in what ways should the government be involved? Um, and I should tell you that that's something I'm not going to talk about today, but I do talk about in my book is, is the idea of perpetual motion and perpetual motion machines. And uh, when Jefferson is president, there's this plethora of letters from these inventors that are asking the president to give financial backing to their perpetual motion machines. And what's wonderful about it is that Jefferson saved these letters. Um, and usually there aren't any replies, but uh, there's a lot of them. So there's at least this expectation that perhaps you'll get um, either patents or monopolies or financial backing from the government for these technologies. And it's always poised in terms of how will this benefit the nation? I mean, it's never going to be, here's how it's going to in benefit me. Please give me money. It's like my invention is going to further the ambitions of, of the United States. Um, and it's not just perpetual motion. I mean, many people do this. So with STEAM, again, um, if you look at the ways in which people become fascinated with it, not just as a, as a sort of an abstract technology, but the way that it's applied, and particularly with, with steamboats. So this is a, the patent for the calliope, you know, music you can create from steam engines on steamboats. And there's many, many pieces of music that are composed for steamboats, and, and especially for particular steamboats. So this is the Alita Waltz. Um, and I think from, from reading through some music histories that um, in many cases, this might have actually been sold on board the Alita. This is sort of like, here's your souvenir. You've written, you've taken a steamboat ride. Here's this sheet of music, take it home and play it for your family and friends, you know, so they can, they can have that experience too. So here's some more band boxes. There's another plate um, with these steam, steam engines um, illustrating them that you could serve on your dinner table or, or put your collar bands in. And this, this is something, this is pretty amazing. So in certainly from the early 18th century into the early 19th century, there's, there's this, the popularity for these extremely elaborate handcrafted wallpapers. And some of them span, you know, many, many walls, not just one section. So this is wallpaper that at, as we speak, is in the diplomatic reception room at the White House. And apparently Jacqueline Kennedy was responsible for retrieving this from a house that was being dismantled in Maryland. So this, this wallpaper is um, early 19th century. It was put up in a house in, in Maryland. Um, and so she had it taken out, restored, and, and put in the White House. So this, this is a, a photograph just after it was in, installed there with some unknown um, white White House person, but uh, here's what it looks like in in full living color. So it's this wonderful combination of this, the powers of the natural world. So this is Niagara Falls, um, and the powers of the man-made world with this steamboat, which of course has an American flag flying flying from it in the foreground. Um, and this is wallpaper that people would have had in their house. Um, and one one of the things that my students are always puzzled by is like people want technology as decoration. I'm like, uh, well, let's think this through. And, you know, I'm sure you could think of some modern examples. They're just different examples. Um, but this, this celebration of technology doesn't stop with just having a dinner plate. I mean, it could, it could be anywhere and it could be, you know, extremely impressive. And, and this kind of relates back to um, the sociability aspects of having a solar microscope and inviting your friends over that, you know, obviously this is something wealthy people could afford to do to have this, this handcrafted wallpaper and have on display in, in your house, the celebration of, of the natural world and the man-made world. Okay. So, me. so yeah. Susan, so we're closing in on uh, the end of the hour. So um, yeah. if you would like to, um, Tell us what your conclusions might be, and then I, I'll have a couple questions for you. I will. Okay. Um, so then I'm going to rapidly skip ahead, and you're just going to have to be teased by the rest of it. So like I was saying, um, one of the things that I, I, my students are always puzzled about is 
do we do we really have we really dismissed this idea of our fascination with technology or have we at least you know moved on to consuming it or interacting with it in different ways and i'll, I'll just leave you here with a, a couple of of these images it's just like maybe not maybe we don't have dinner plates maybe we don't have chair backs um but there's there's you still run across these ways in which clearly we're celebrating in a very personal way um, our experience of, of technology. Um, and then just this one more that I actually conclude the book with. So this is at the Centennial Exhibition in 1876, among all the other kinds of technologies that are on display. Statue of Liberty is not complete yet, but this part of it is. And so it's one of the things um, that was not only exhibited, but as you can see from the stereograph, people could pay to go up in the torch um, and, and ex have a personal experience of at least that piece of what was then called liberty enlightening the world. You know, we now know it as, as the Statue of Liberty. Um, so just these, these wonderful celebrations of technology, but also in the way it's framed and the way people talk about it, the ways in which technology becomes part of our, our national ident identity and in many times in terms of our, our national agenda for promoting um, political economy and, and promoting our, our development. And I mean, we still do that to a certain extent, but I, I think not quite so intensively as this moment that we see pretty much from the beginning of the 19th century toward till towards the end of the 19th century. Um, which is a shame. There, there should be more of this. There should be more mm -hmm. iPad t-shirts in the world. But, yeah. Anyway. Well, I think one thing that is different is that um, Americans are not so, um, uh, not exactly insecure, but, but anxious about what it means to be an American as opposed to being an English person or a European. And so we don't have to promote uh, American ingenuity in the same way that people probably felt they needed to in the in the 19th century. Is that your impression? No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think it has diminished. But so one of one of the last things that I have in my conclusion, you know, sort of like how how does how does this bring us up to the present day? And I, not quite present day, but think about the space race. Think, think about what happens you know, between the Russians and the Americans um, in the 1950s, well, from the 40s, but certainly in the 50s and in 60s, um, and, and the ways in which nationalism and technology and play, play in together. And um, for those of us who are old, old enough to remember, like, certainly by the 60s, it's like there's a reason why there's suddenly this uptick in encouraging children to be involved in science and, and the ways in which children's toys, spaceships, rocket ships, pajamas with rockets on them, right? I mean, it, that's, it's not an accident. It's like, again, that consumer participation in these ideological ideals is, is still there. Um, and, you know, so maybe maybe it's it's particular moments in time, as opposed to what seems to be true in the early 19th century, just, you know, one after the other and the ways in which you have these overlapping technologies that that are exciting people. Um, but but clearly that that is still there. And, and so that's the the most recent one that I mentioned in my book. But, I'm you know, I'm sure there, there are right. ways in which we can you can think about that even even today. I mean, maybe it's not quite so directly one one country's technology poised against another but you know in 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 some ways just thinking about how well we, when we talk about emphasizing stem um in education right um and and stem for young women it's like we want more people involved in that because it's not just that we want them to be educated and not just that we want more scientists around but it's something that's going to be good for our national development and prestige Right. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I was really intrigued by the range of topics that you discuss in the book, everything from balloons to phrenology as, um, you know, examples of things we might dismiss today, but also steam engines and other things that um, that are, are very central to the development of 
many products we use today. Um, so I'm wondering if there were other topics that you wish you would have been able to include if you had had more space in the book. I, well, I think I originally thought of including more natural history. Um, yeah, and so again, in the, in the conclusion, when I'm talking about the, the centennial and some of the things that are on exhibit, uh, and getting back to you know Jefferson trying to get a giant moose to send to Buffon to make him <laughs> the uncle. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, that's a that's a whole stream of again like the rhetoric that develops around the kinds of things that that uh, people are seeking or or hoping to find or once they find how they categorize them also fits into to national development. I mean you know Lewis when when Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark out west with the core of discovery, I mean, he had a whole to-do list for them that included diplomatic relations with Native Americans and, you know, finding waterways, you you name it. Um, but they were also charged with uh, fi finding what, what natural history was out there. It's like what flora and fauna is in the West that we don't know about. Um, and the subtext to that is, and, you know, and of what use might we make it, which, goes right. well back to 17th and 18th century bio prospecting. So, you know, that that's like a whole category that I left out and and partly mostly I left it out because even though you can see the same kinds of agendas and the same kinds of framing in terms of political ideology, you don't see the same extent of popular engagement and certainly not in consumer products that you see with these these technologies. Um, okay. So I think that would be, yeah. that would probably be like a whole different book that would have to have a whole different slant to it. But, you know, there's, there's, there's little glimmers of it there, clearly. Right. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point, because um, before we started, I was talking about, you know, the, the literary influence on the development of national identity in the 19th century. And um, I hadn't been thinking about its link to consumerism, um, but certainly there were uh, our literary examples that uh, became so popular that they inspired other kinds of consumer products. And yeah. um, it would be very interesting to to think about what kinds of of developments inspire consumerism and which ones didn't for whatever reason at particular times. Right. Or, or anti, -cons I mean, so for instance, yeah. Thoreau, it's like, there's, yeah. there's numerous occasions where he's like, he hated the railroads. Um, you know, the way, the ways in which these, these modern devices were just, just not only interfering with the natural world, but sort of just, just making the pace of life faster, making people work harder in ways that they shouldn't have to work. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there is a lot of, pushback and and definitely from um you know especially from the the transcendentalists and and other people mm -hmm. like that for the the early 19th century um so one of the things that i i didn't get to show in terms of steam so somebody actually invented a steam man a robot <laughs> um yeah named dederick and took up took out a patent on it now a it seemed like the prototype cost thousands of dollars which translate that into, you know, 1850s, 1860s, 1870s money. Um, and, and also, you know, I think he tended to topple over a lot. But what's interesting is that, that you begin to see speculative fiction right around the same time about robots. And in fact, the first dime novel um, in the United States, uh, or the first dime novel series in the United States is about the steam man and the steam man's adventures all over you know, usually in the plains or in, in the West. Um, and again, this fascination people have with something that's not quite ready for prime time, but let's, you know, in the same way you can speculate about people taking balloon voyages around the world, you can speculate that there really could be steam people. Um, and there's this wonderful short story. I'm not sure if it's by a recognized American writer, but I mean, 
lots of stories are not by recognized American writers, again, around the same time that it's, it's about a man who has a dream. He's woken up in the future and there's steam robots everywhere, um, <laughs> including performing Hamlet on stage. You know, it's like when they, they, they can speak through their, their steam pipes, kind of like the calliopes or what have you. Um, and, but, it, but again, it's, 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 it's actually a dystopia rather than a utopia. Of, of what can go wrong. So, you know, just like Thoreau right. being horrified by all of this. So yeah, yeah. So there's lots of literature. Yeah. There, the authors and writers and, and essayists definitely respond many times negatively, but sometimes positively to what's happening. Right. Yeah, there was a lot of simultaneous uh, fascination with automatons too. And the anxiety was, Will automatons become so realistic that we will not be able to distinguish between an actual human being and an automaton? And, and that's what we're we, talking about now, yep, right? Yeah, ex it's exactly what we're talking about now. Yeah. Okay, well, we have reached uh, two o'clock. So thank you so much. Um, it's a fascinating book. And uh, I wish we had more time to talk about more of it, but uh, we can just go read the rest of the chapters for ourselves. Yes, you can. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye. Bye.